Hi, everyone. Good morning or afternoon, depends on where you are around our globe. My name is Leanne Wynn, and I'm a shark ambassador with Sharks for Kids. Thank you so much for joining us here today online. Just as an FYI, today's call, you will be muted. So if you have any questions, and please feel free to send any and all questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of our screen. Um, I will be behind the scenes answering some, and we'll also hold some to, at the end of our presentation to have our um, guest answer these. For those of you who are not familiar with Sharks for Kids, we're a volunteer group of shark enthusiasts. We are divers, educators, researchers, scientists, artists, videographers, et cetera, et cetera. And we're simply just trying to create the next generation of shark advocates um, by teaching kids about sharks and the importance that they have in our oceans. How do we do this? We do this through in-person classroom visits, also virtual-based presentations like the one that you are joining us for here today. Um, we have all sorts of fun and free activities, crafts, education material, et cetera, et cetera, on our website. But I'll give you a sneak peek of that at the end. Um, but today, our Shark Talk, we have with us my friend, Dr. Neil Hammerschlag. And Neil is actually the director of the Shark Research Center at the University of Miami Rosenstiel School of Marine Atmospheric Science. So I will ask the first question to start us off, which is generally what everybody questions about. Neil, how did you get into what you're doing? Um, thanks, Leanne. It's, it's great to be here. It's great to see you. It's great to speak to kids here and all around the world about sharks and what I do. And I'm excited to answer all your questions and talk to you guys. So specific to your question, how did I get to do where, uh, where, what I'm doing now? Uh, the answer is a lot of school. Um, I was, I've been in school pretty much my whole life. And I, I always loved the ocean like a lot of people. But getting into science and getting to study sharks is not necessarily only about loving the ocean. It's about loving science, too. And so it involves a lot of school. And so something that's really important is you can help sharks and you can love sharks in many different ways and uh, that isn't through science. So you could go into art or film or um, storytelling or, you know, all, you know, filmmaking, um, working, you know, in aquariums, you know, but I chose to learn about sharks through, um, through studying them as a scientist. And so that is meant I had to learn how to be a scientist first. And so I went to a lot of school. Um, I actually, I grew up in Canada. So I went to um, the University of Toronto. So I went to college, the University of Toronto, where I studied ecology, which is really a study of how organisms interact with their environment and how the environment impacts organisms. Uh, and then after that, I, so I got my bachelor's degree. And then I went for more school uh, after I graduated college to get my master's degree. And then I studied marine biology. And after that, I went for more graduate school uh, to do my uh, PhD, my doctor of philosophy in marine biology and fisheries at the University of Miami. And I've continued to work there as a researcher. And um, yeah, so, so I guess the answer is a lot of school, um, but also making sure I learn a lot and learn a lot about what I'm interested in. And I think the more you learn the, you know, by teaching yourself, by watching documentaries or reading books or attending webinars like this series is one, what fascinates you. And I think each person can take that opportunity to learn about different aspects of sharks and marine biology and think about what aspect most suits their interests and their fascination. And then from that, you know, learn more about it. And I think the more you learn about what you're interested in, the more you're gonna uh, become experienced in that. And then it will show you the opportunities for you to get involved. And for example, 
I learned about marine science. And when I was in university, I volunteered for different marine science organizations and got experience doing that and met the people that were doing that. And eventually that, you know, led to opportunities to do more projects in school, which ultimately led to where I am today. Thank you so much for that. And big thing again, stay in school. And right now, although many of us are not in school physically, we're still doing so much at home. Um, and you know, for, as a teacher personally, and to all those teachers, thank you so much for you know doing this for kids. And thank you to scientists that are helping you know with talks. Thank you for everybody participating. So let's jump into it. Tell us about satellite tagging sharks, Neil. Okay, hey, awesome. So today I'm going to talk to you, as as Leanne said, about uh, satellite tagging and tracking sharks for science. And uh, we tag sharks and track them in order to understand their movements and learn about their movements. So, you know, broadly speaking, um, we're interested in, in shark movements. And this is important because almost any aspect of life, any aspect of, of any behavior or involves movement in some level, whether uh, it's a animal hunting its prey, whether it's the prey trying to escape, whether it's migration, so animals you know, migrating to, which means making long distance movements to areas where it might be going there to reproduce, to have babies, or moving to areas to go and um, making these long distance movements to areas for feeding, or just socializing in groups, that all involves movement. So movement is very critical to animals, to, uh, to their life. All aspects of their life involve some level of movement, which is why as scientists, it's very important for us to study animal movement. Now on land, you know, one of the, the, the great things about being on land and studying movement is we can watch it, right? So in this picture, uh, I think it's a great picture. You see a helicopter looking at this, these giraffes moving, these giraffes migrating. And, you know, scientists can follow these giraffes and from either, you know, a car or from a helicopter and see where they go. What directions do they take? How many are in their group? Where do they go to have babies? Where do they go to feed? Uh, where do they go to escape predators? Where do they go to sleep? And you can use this information to help protect uh, and these, these giraffes. For example, it'd be very important to make sure that we're protecting all the moms, and uh, especially if they're pregnant, and areas they might be going to give birth. And so we can follow along and, and watch these giraffes and, uh, and protect them where they go, and protect important areas that are important for the, for the life of these, of these giraffes. However, in the oceans, we face a much big, bigger challenge in studying the movements of animals, especially sharks, and that's because pretty much shark movement is invisible to us. You know, sharks move very large distances, but they're essentially moving under the, the ocean. The ocean makes it almost invisible for us to see what's going on underneath. If you think about it, even when we go scuba diving, we can only go to places close to shore. Uh, we can only go for, you know, most an hour at a time. And we can only really go where there's light available to us, which is really within the first 100 feet. And so we really can't spend a lot of time underwater and we can't follow sharks around underwater to see what they're doing. I mean, and we certainly can't fly a helicopter and see through the ocean and see what they're doing. I mean, if you think about it, if you flew a helicopter over this water, you'd see the exact same thing, just blue. So this is really a monumental challenge for scientists to study the movements of sharks because it's invisible to us. So in order to study the movements, we've relied on tracking the animals uh, and tagging the animals. And so I'm gonna explain to you some of the first, some of the types of ways that we've tracked animals and tagged animals. The, the first and most common and also the most basic is just using identification tags. What these are, if you see these, these 
here are simply identification tags. There are, they look like a, a string of spaghetti almost, but essentially it's a piece of plastic that's got a unique number on each one of them and a phone number, a contact number for the scientist. And this here is a little dart anchor that attaches to the shark. So essentially you place one of these tags, these identification tags on the shark right below the dorsal fin. And they have each a unique ID code and contact information for the scientists. And here's a picture of a nurse shark that's got one of these ID tags. And the scientist then releases this shark into the wild. Now we can't follow the shark along. We can't track the shark. This is not an electronic tag. It doesn't provide us the opportunity to actually follow along with the shark and kind of see what they're doing in real time. What this relies on is the scientist or someone else recapturing the shark at some other time and then reporting that tag to the scientist. So basically when a scientist puts this ID tag on the shark, we release it into the wild, we know where we tag the shark, we know when we tag the shark, and we have that unique ID, but then we have no idea what happens to that shark unless at some other point in time we recapture that shark and can look at that ID number and confirm that was the shark from the previous time, and we can essentially look to see how, what was the, what was the difference on where we tagged it and where we recaptured it and how far it moved, or we rely on someone else like a fisherman to recapture that shark and call us using the contact information on the tag and report that shark to us. So the information we get is actually really just a starting point where we tag the shark and the finish point where either we recaptured that shark or someone else did. And here's an example of the types of movement data that you can get. So this is a map of South Florida here. And these are for, these are paths that from, uh, that from three different species of sharks that we tag. The black are nurse sharks, the red are tiger sharks, and the white are lemon sharks, okay? The um, circles are the location where we tag the shark, and the triangles are where uh, we recaptured them. And the lines are simply drawn between the tagging location and the location that they're recaptured. And so all we know is where we tagged it and where it was recaptured. And in terms of movement, that gives us an idea of the scale of where they might move, but doesn't really tell us the path they take or how long they took to get there or what they did, at, it doesn't tell us anything about what the shark did between where we tagged it and where we recaptured it. And it also uh, doesn't really uh, give us, you know, it really also, the other issue is it relies on us having to recapture that shark. So if we don't recapture it or a fisherman doesn't recapture it, or if they recapture and don't report it to us, we have no idea what ever happened to that shark. So this is, gives us very basic, basic movement information. So in order to get more advanced information about the behavior of these sharks and their movement, we rely on satellite tags, which is a type of electronic tag, which I'm gonna tell you about. And there's two main types of satellite tags that are used by shark scientists. And the first one I'm gonna tell you about is called a pop-off archival satellite tag also known as a PSAT tag for short. And essentially, if you look in this picture here in the top left, this is a picture of a PSAT tag, kind of looks a bit like an ice cream cone, but essentially it is a, a, a computer that, and with a float, this round part is a float with an antenna. And right here, this is uh, the attachment point, it's a little dart anchor that is what actually uh, is inserted into the shark. So this is a picture of a great white shark. This is a PSAT tag or a pop-off archival satellite tag that is attached to this great white shark. And what happens is the scientist tags the shark, this anchor attaches to the shark and stays in there. And what this tag does is it records, it measures the light around the shark. It measures the depth the shark is swimming at 
and it also measures the temperature the shark is experiencing while it's swimming. And this type of tag is really good for getting an idea of the different temperatures the shark, the temperatures of the water that the sharks like, or the preferred swimming depth. And so this gives us an idea of their behavior in terms of their preferences for the environment. What is their preferred temperature? What is their preferred swimming depth? It, it does not really give great data in terms of their movement. We are able to, to tell a very, uh, in a very coarse way where the shark was tagged, where it ended up, and the approximate path it took, but it doesn't really give very good accurate information on what, where the actual shark is at any given time. The other thing about this is tag is we can't actually follow the shark in real time and see what it's doing in real time. What this tag does is it records, you know, as I mentioned, the depth and the temperature experienced by the sharks. And it's, it stays, that information stays in the tag. It, and the only way a scientist can get that information is the tag is actually programmed to detach from the shark, usually after around six months to nine months. And it floats to the surface. And once it pops off and floats to the surface, detach it from the shark and floats up to the surface and it's just hanging out at the surface. And then sends all the information that was stored in the tag on the depth and the temperature and the light experienced by the sharks, sends that information to a satellite that's flying over in space. And then that satellite sends then that information to the scientists. So again, here we can't really follow in real time, but we get information, particularly valuable information on the depth and temperature preferences of the sharks after these tags pop off and send that information to a satellite that then beams that information to the scientist. So now I'm going to tell you about another type of tag that actually does allow us to follow sharks in pretty much real time, very close to real time, and tell us very good, very accurately where these sharks are actually moving in real time. And this type of tag is called a smart position and temperature transmitting tag, also known as a spot tag. And we attach these tags to the fin, the dorsal fin of the sharks. We attach them to the dorsal fin of the sharks. And here you can see a bull shark with one of these tags. And essentially when the shark comes near the surface, this tag then will uh, break the water surface because when the shark's fin is above the surface and it actually will then send a signal to uh, a satellite in space and will actually then beam that a message to the scientist telling exactly where that shark was when it broke the surface. And here I'm gonna show you a video of our team. This is videos uh, up from Discovery Channel that filmed our team doing research. This is myself and our, my students and team actually securing a tiger shark. This is a very big tiger shark to a platform. We're placing a spot tag on its fin. We now released this tiger shark, it's swimming off. And as it's swimming off, you can see that spot tag on its fin. And when that shark comes to the surface, Again, it sends a message to a satellite and tells us where that shark is, and we can kind of follow them in near real time. So this is really exciting. And there's a lot of scientists around the world that are using this tag, and it's really great to follow these sharks in real time, and we know where they are when they break the surface. So it's irregular. We don't know all the time. We can't follow them all the time, but essentially we get a position when they break the surface, and we can kind of connect the dots to see where that is. And there are a lot of scientists now using these satellite tags. And I want to tell you about a really cool project. And that's called the Global Shark Movement Project. And it is essentially a global initiative where different scientists all around the world that are, are tracking sharks can actually share our data from all different species all over the world to try to better understand and study shark movements. And what I'm going to show you is right now is actually a, a map, a global map, looking at the tracks of the movements of 23 different species of sharks. Okay, these are what you're looking at is actually the tracks from over 1,680 sharks of 23 different species all around the world, and this was made possible by over 150 scientists from all over the world 
sharing their data on of their satellite tracking data. So as a group, we can kind of understand where across the globe different sharks are moving. And so this is a this is there this is a, a really a beautiful map and it's provided really cool information so we can look at species differences by species in their movements differences in by area and get an idea of how and where different shark species move and this is we can take this information and look to actually find areas that sharks that are really important for sharks areas that these sharks actually spend lots of, of their time and so this is a map of looking at all those different sharks tracked all around the world by the different scientists. And what we did is we looked to see where are areas that are preferentially used by these, all these different species of shark. Where are spots, where are hot spots where different species are spending overlap in where they spend a lot of their time. And if you look at the map here, this is the map of the world, the areas that you see that are more red are areas where different species of sharks are spending more time. The redder the color, it what is the redder the color, or where different species of sharks that are tracked by all the different researchers are spending more of their time. So we can see these hot spots, these really important areas for different shark species that are shared by different shark species. And this is really important because we can actually now identify areas that are really important for sharks that different species are, are using and spending a lot, of more, lot more time there. And then what we can do is actually think about, wow, what does this mean for uh, protecting sharks? What does this mean for the survival of sharks? Seems to me that protecting areas where lots of different species are spending most of their time is, is a good location for conservation. And so what in this in this study as part of this project not only did we look at shark hotspots but we actually compared them to where fishing occurs. And so this map is actually a map another global map and the colors you see on the map are actually areas where fishing occurs. And the redder the color here the kind of more yellow the more red the color are areas that are more intensely fished where there's more fishing, including fishing for sharks, in particular fishing that will, will capture sharks. And then what we did is we actually overlapped the, the areas that are used by the sharks, where, that are really important for the sharks, with the areas where there's lots of fishing. So looking at overlap between shark and fishing. And what you're looking at here is a map, again, a global map, looking at that overlap. The areas here, you can see their, their colors on this map. The areas that are that go from red to orange to kind of a yellowish white, the areas that are more yellowish white are areas that are uh, higher overlap between shark hotspots and fishing areas. And the actual blue dots on the map are areas where the sharks that we've tagged have been captured by uh, these fishing vessels. And so what we're finding is that a lot of the hotspots shared by these different species of sharks actually overlap with fishing that targets sharks. And as a result, a lot of the sharks that we've been tracking are actually being captured. And so this is giving us an idea of how vulnerable these sharks are that we're tracking to fishing. And it's identifying areas that we need to protect. Areas that are really important to sharks, that are hot spots for sharks, where lots of different species are spending their time, where they're also being targeted by fishing, are areas that we need to prioritize, that need to be prioritized for protection. So now not only can we identify the risk to, to fishing for these different species of sharks, but also prioritize areas that, that are in need of, of better protection. And those are areas where are, that are important, that are hotspots for multiple species of sharks that are also being targeted by fisheries. And so I've tried to show you how we can use this data and satellite tracking data uh, to understand shark movements and also to uh, get information 
about their vulnerability to phishing and identify areas that are, would be very important to protect to help conserve sharks. But I wanna make the point that shark tagging, and tagging sharks is just one tool. Tagging is one tool in the scientific tool belt. And a lot of people you know, are, are familiar with the concept of tagging sharks and have heard about shark tagging. And I've told you about shark tagging, but I wanted to say that shark tagging is just really one of the tools in the scientific tool belt. So here is an example of you know, the uh, house building tools and you see hammers and wrenches and screwdrivers. Well, satellite tags are the equivalent of, for example, a hammer. It's a very important tool, but you can't build a house with a hammer alone. We need to use a whole bunch of different tools, measuring tapes, we need to use all different screwdrivers, you know, nails. There's lots of different tools that are important in order to answer really important questions. And so scientists, we don't just use tags, we use multiple different tools to answer different questions of importance. And I'm going to give you, uh, tell you a little bit about a study that I think helps demonstrate that point. And it's work that I've been doing with my colleagues on tiger sharks, and where we're using multiple tools, not just tagging, but multiple tools to better understand uh, the behavior of tiger sharks and, and to better not only understand them, but to collect information that can ultimately help us better protect them. So here is a picture of a beautiful tiger shark, and we've been satellite tagging tiger sharks. And if you satellite tag tiger sharks, and which my team has done, you get a map with all these different points on it. So here is a map, and every yellow dot there is actually a position of where a tiger shark came to the surface and transmitted their location with a spot tag. So as you can see, there's lots of yellow dots. And if we do some analyses on these dots, we can actually look to see where there are more dots in certain areas and where the sharks are spending more time. We can actually identify areas that are important for these tiger sharks. So this map here is a map of the US coastline from, from Florida all the way up you know, the coast to, to Cape Cod. And what you're looking at here, these, these blotches of color are telling us where these sharks spend most of their time. The redder the color, it means like a, an area that is used more. So an area where these sharks are spending more of their time. And this is what the sharks movements, these are the areas used by the sharks. And again, the more orange red color are telling us areas that are more heavily used and more important to these sharks where they spend more of their time. And this is what those areas look like, their home ranges in the summer. And you can see it's distributed along the whole coastline, okay, up until pretty much New York. And this over here is their winter distribution, their winter ranges. And what we can see is that their, their movements and their home ranges are much more restricted. And in fact, they're centered, if you look here, uh, there's this big red spot right in the Bahamas. This is, this is actually the Bahamas, Bahama Bahamian Islands here. And in Northern Bahamas, we can see this red spot. So we found that there's a really important area here for these sharks in the Northern Bahamas. And so my team went there and it turns out, it's an, this is the spot, it's an area called Tiger Beach. And it's actually a sh very shallow uh, sandy area, which is actually somewhat surprising to us because we didn't know that tiger sharks really like to be in these really shallow areas. And so we went there to go see if we could find tiger sharks and try to figure out why they were spending so much time in this area. So if you go to Tiger Beach like I did and you jump in the water, you can see these amazing tiger sharks. And I took this picture of these three beautiful big tiger sharks. These are all sharks that are over 12 feet long, three tiger sharks, shallow sandy water, sandy bottom, shallow water. And it really so, so we identified that this was a hotspot for these tiger sharks through our satellite tracking, showed that these sharks are spending a lot of time here. But we didn't know why they were spending a lot of time here. But one clue was that all these sharks were very big and all these sharks were female. So it, we thought that, you know, if this area was important for food, there would be both males and females. But the fact that really the site is only found, on, we only find big females here, led my team to think that maybe 
uh, these sharks could be here for some reason related to reproduction. And so we actually wondered if these females could possibly be pregnant. Now, you know, to figure that out, we had to come up with kind of a unique way to how do you tell if a, a, if a, if a tiger shark is pregnant? Well, so I, so I contacted my friend and another scientist named James Sulikowski, and we came up with an idea to actually try to do an ultrasound on these sharks, like they do at hospitals when, when humans are being looked at to see if they're pregnant. And so we got this portable ultrasound that you can take out on the boat. And you can, and here's a, a video of James and myself, and he's looking into goggles that can see using this probe inside the belly of these tiger sharks. And we actually found that many of them were in fact pregnant. In fact, some of the tiger sharks had as many as 20 pups inside of them. So this, as we've been combining tools and looking at you know, the sharks and by combining tools, we've, been, we've identified this as a hotspot for the sharks. We've been able to do this ultrasound to figure out that they're pregnant. And now we've actually been adding satellite tags to these pregnant sharks to see where the pregnant females are going to give birth. So here is a video. This is Tiger Beach. These are the points of a satellite tagged shark that is actually pregnant, a 13 foot pregnant tiger shark. And we're tracking her and we're following her around to see where this pregnant tiger shark is, to see where she goes, to see if she's going into areas where she might be vulnerable to fishing or, and to figure out where she might be giving birth. And so what's really unique is combining the different tools to answer questions about where are they going, why are they going there, and ultimately to understand and, and find out if there are areas where we need to protect for, to help these sharks, like areas where they might be giving birth or special areas where the pregnant females are spending most of their time. So I just wanted to talk to you briefly about some of the tracking we do and give you some examples. I wanted to also mention that uh, my team at the Shark Research and Conservation Program at the University of Miami uh, go out on boats on a regular basis uh, to, to study sharks. We, and we bring along school groups. We actually bring along uh, kids to join us on the boat to help us with our science. There are kids that are generally um, from age 10 to 15, and they actually help us with our science. So here's a, a school group of 20 kids from middle school that are coming out on our boat to help us tag a shark. This is a, a uh, great hammerhead shark that they helped us tag and sample and do research on. So I, if you guys are, are ever wanna come out and see sharks and study them with us, check out our website. It's sharktagging.com, which you can learn more about this. And also on our website, I know we're all at home uh, right now. Um, you know, we're not in school, but if you go to our website, sharktagging.com, you can also follow our sharks and actually track some of the sharks that we're tracking. We have an opportunity for you guys to go track our sharks in, in cool Google Earth Maps. So if you go to sharktagging.com to education, you can actually follow some of the sharks that we are satellite tracking. And we also have curriculum. We also have a whole bunch of cool assignments and uh, uh, learning um, modules about sharks, about the ocean. So although we're home and we can't actually go out on the water to, to, to learn about sharks or to learn about the oceans or even see the ocean, if you go to our website, you can find all these cool tools and, and, and ways to learn about the ocean, including blogs that we have there, online curricula, online kind of cool assignments, fun assignments, and even being able to track our sharks. And I'd like to say that none of these activities are something that I can do by myself. I'm very lucky to have a really great team. And this is a picture of my lab my, and our team and some really awesome people that um, help us go do our science and collect this information that can better help conserve these sharks. So with that, I thank you very much. And uh, I am happy to take some questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Neil. It looks like the program's continuing on. And definitely, if you're in that area, 
I brought my students out and it's a great experience. Um, and I just wanted to make a point. One thing, very observant 10 year old, Olivia from Texas asked me a question, what is NMFS? So if you weren't sure, that's the National Marine Fisheries Service. Just wanted to make sure that you got that. Um, but we did have one general question that everybody kind of always asks. And Neil, what is your favorite shark? That's a real tough question. I would say I really love, uh, I have to say now I really love the tiger shark. Um, it used to be the great hammerhead shark, but I've spent so much time with tiger sharks that, and uh, you know, that I, I've, I've changed my mind. I'm saying now it's the tiger shark because they're so big. They have very large eyes that are really expressive and they have these, this beautiful pattern on their body. And it's just, I've been so lucky to be scuba diving with them on many occasions. And, and those experiences have really made me like them even more and definitely is why they are my favorite shark. Awesome, awesome. And they, they are, they're so angelic. The difference in what they look like when they are a pup versus when they're an adult, it's amazing. Um, so let's see, we had another question about some, let's see, oh, Naseba. And I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, but Naseba wanted to know, what's the most difficult part of tagging, the tagging process? Okay. My, the, I think the most difficult part of the tagging process is actually uh, finding sharks, uh, to be honest with you. Um, sharks are relatively rare. They, we don't know where they are, you know, essentially. I mean, where, like, they're invisible to us, really, when they're out there. When they're out there just doing their thing, we don't know where they are. So when we go out to the ocean, we're just hoping we, we get a spot where we're trying to our best to encounter them. And um, so just finding them in the first place is probably the most challenging part of it. Awesome. It's funny because I was going to say the exact same thing and then I was like, we'll, we'll ask it live, but it goes to show. <laughs> um, now we have another person, Kathy. Kathy has a very specific question about the tags themselves. Are the tags known to hurt the sharks? And what percentage of tag sharks have been harmed due to the process? Yeah, that's a great, great question. So these are different types of tags and you have to realize that our goal as scientists is to study, we, we care about these sharks, we wanna help these sharks, we wanna conserve these sharks. So we're trying to do whatever we can to make sure that these sharks are, are healthy, first of all. So the tags that we use are designed as much as possible to not harm the sharks. Um, the ones that I told you about, those spot tags that we put on their fin, uh, the reason we put them on their fin is because their fins are actually, uh, are, are in, they don't really, they don't have uh, nerves in them. They're not composed of nerves that would, would actually cause pain. Um, they're mostly just skin, cartilage, and uh, protein fibers, kind of like uh, similar to, um, you know, types of, of protein that's in your nail. So it's a softer version of your, of your nails. And so it, it doesn't hurt the sharks. And in fact, um, they can heal up rather quickly. So, and a lot of these tags are designed to actually fall off over time. And one of the things about sharks is they have incredible uh, healing abilities. And often when sharks actually, they, they, they fight. And when they fight, they bite each other. And those, and they bite each other in the fins, and that heals really, really quickly. And so, some of the reason that we tag sharks the way we do is to um, is to prevent uh, harm to them. And that includes one of the reasons why we do it on their fins, because again, the fins they're not going to feel pain. And the other reason is that uh, they it will heal. Um, they have great healing ability. Um, you know, I, the bigger concern is, you know, the amount of time it takes to tag them often can be stressful. And so it really depends on the species. And so species that kind of get more stressed out, um, have more of a stress response and get stressed out quicker, we try not to tag those individuals or we try to do it faster. So um, great hammerhead is a species of shark, for example, that um, gets stressed out a little faster. So we don't tag those ones 
with satellite tags in the same way. Um, but for example, tiger shark is a species that doesn't get stressed out. And so they're ones that we can, we can um, take a little longer tagging them uh, and uh, because they're really, they're built like a tank and they don't get stressed out. Cool. Now, thank you for addressing that. Now you're talking about all these sharks that you tag. Can you give an estimate on how many sharks you have tagged? Because Nerithra would like to know. So um, we remember I told you about the ID tags. So with the ID tags, we tag about 400 sharks with those ID tags every single year. So I tag about 400 of sh different sharks with those ID tags every year. Uh, but with satellite tags, uh, it's probably close to about on average 10 to 15 a year. You're on mute. Yes, I was, I was saying in my head, I repeat, I was like 10 to 15. <laughs> there you go. All right, now let's continue with these specifics of questions. Samantha has one, says, Dr. Neal, is there an impact on the shark's movement after it is tagged, meaning the fin functions is the shark's movement, so how does that impact it? So that's a great question. Um, the tags are designed to be of a shape and size that it won't impact their ability to move around or the way they move. I think after, you know, often these sharks are, um, we have to capture them in order to tag them. So I think sometimes after the capture event, uh, they can be a little um, disoriented. So maybe um, for the first two hours, they might be a little disoriented. But then after that, it appears that, you know, they go back to doing their thing. And in fact, there are times that I've tagged a shark and uh, captured a shark carefully, uh, put a tag on it, and then um, the next day got in the water scuba diving and seen that shark swimming around the exact same spot and you know, didn't sh show any signs of being stressed out or disoriented or didn't show any issues with its Okay. One thing that can happen is that if these tags um, we put in the ocean, there's a lot of um, organisms that actually are like small little organisms that are in the ocean that can actually grow on the tag like algae. And that can cause um, the tags that get covered in, in algae that can, uh, I think could add some uh, resistance to their swimming ability, add some drag. Um, but that's why we, we try to, we coat the tags. I mean, at least I do, and I know other researchers do. We actually put a material on the tags. We coat them with a type of paint that prevents these little organisms from growing on them, like barnacles and algae and other things. Awesome, yeah. Um, now, you went through and you told us on the website where to find, but we actually had someone who joined you on one of your UM shark tagging trips and tagged a nurse shark and named the shark. Their name is Kiefer, and they're wondering, how do I get that information about the shark that I tagged? Oh, that's a good question. I would say you should um, send me uh, a, a, um... email. Ooh, yeah, can you hear me? That's a good question. I would say, so you would, you would have, if you named the shark, we probably would have given you the information. But the thing is with the nurse sharks, we aren't tagging them with uh, satellite tags. They're, we're, they're being tagged with those ID tags. So we only know where we tagged it and if we or someone else recaptured that shark. And sometimes we have that information. And if you want, you can email us. Go to our website, sharktagging.com, and there's a contact form. And you can email us and ask if you've got any information, if that shark was ever recaptured, and we can look it up for you. Cool, there we go, thank you. Well, speaking about connecting you with people that you've met also, we have a shout out. Sophia Diaz said, um, thanks so much. I'm enjoying listening to you. You may not remember me, but I was a Girl Scout that interviewed you last year at SharkCon. So she just wanted to say hi. Oh yeah, I remember her. Hi, Sophia. Cool. Um, and another thing, this goes to show that we reach students of all ages. Um, Naseeba is actually a graduate in marine biology and wants to continue in marine science working on sharks, currently working with WCS, Wildlife Conservation Society, which is out of New York. 
um, in Mozambique, where they're doing a project on sharks and rays since 2018. So that's totally wow. cool. Definitely so stay in cool. touch with all of us. Um, now, somebody had just a general question of, is shark tagging safe? And now I don't know necessarily if they mean for the shark or the person, you've touched on you know, how it's you know, helping and what precautions we take for the sharks, but what about us? What about your team? Is it, is it safe for your team? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is, um, you know what? We, this is not something that anyone can just do. We, we train our team. It can, it, it can be, um, it is safe because we take precautions and we train our team to do it. And, you know, and this is not something that you can just go out and, and do um, if you're, if you're not trained. And so, um, you know, luckily, you know, I think the biggest safe issue is just being on a boat. You know, it's very easy to slip and fall if it's wet and you're not, or it's bumpy and you can knock your hand. So I think the biggest thing is to just, when you're around on a boat is just to be kind of always have one hand on the boat and have a, a team that is works well and has good teamwork and has good communication and to have a strategy and plan on how you're going to, um, you know, how you're going to handle the situation, how you're gonna do this, do the tagging process so that way it can be as, as safe as possible. Because, I mean, it is, you're on a boat, you're on the ocean, which can be moving and uh, moving up and down. You're working with live animals, you know, they're tools lying around, a lot of those tools are pointy and, uh, you know, you don't wanna end up falling on, on and, and hurting yourself or cutting yourself on one of those tools. So, um, you know, it's, it's important that everyone is like got their wits about them and paying attention and that, you know, is trained and focused and has a plan. Awesome. And, and that's, and that's key. And my experience from being on the boat with you and out as well, it, it's seemingly like when you're going through the process of tagging, it happens so fast because everybody has their role and it kind of goes along like clockwork. Yeah. Um, so I don't see any new questions. So I want to take this time again to say thank you so much for everyone joining us for all the questions that were asked. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, congratulations thank you. on continuing and all the progress and everything um, that your program and your lab is doing. Um, look forward to you know continuing to see more work. And I just want to jump over to just let some people see some things right here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for everybody. You were talking about Sulikowski. So one thing I just want to kind of share with everybody, we actually had Sulikowski on for a webinar. So if you were not able to be part of that, please go to our Sharks for Kids website. And underneath the education tab, we have all of the webinars. So we have all of the upcoming webinars. We have another one actually later this afternoon. And we have continuing up through summer, we're going to be having them. And also any of them in the past, you can go ahead and watch on YouTube. If you're getting a little you know, stir crazy and you don't wanna sit in front of a screen, please check out all of our crafts. So this is kind of a fun, you know, paper and pen kind of going old school where you can just and we have color by numbers, paint by numbers. So there's a whole slew. In addition, all of the curriculum we have here for teachers to utilize as we're continuing through some summer schools and summer camps, and then lots of posters and crafts and fun facts for the students. So again, check us out on Instagram, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, all of the social medias, Sharks for Kids. Um, thank you again, Neil, Dr. Neil Hammerschlag, for joining us. And again, from me to you, uh, be safe and best of health to everyone out there. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye, guys. Thank you.